I am so happy to be here today with Hunter Poole, who has the great honor of being the alumni that I impose on more than any single other person. Hunter graduated eight years ago, 2013, from Walton Honors. And since that time, I've imposed on him every semester. He's been an um, advocate for my class. He's delivered content. He's been a guest speaker, highly entertaining because who else comes in to talk about Reba McIntyre and Beyonce, all in one marketing conversation. He um, serves on the advisory board for the class, and he even puts up with me when I visit New York to show me where he works and what he does. So Hunter, I'm forever grateful to you because you are my first yes and my most enthusiastic one. And I don't take it for granted, but I do continue to impose. So thank you. Well, you're always welcome. And I wish that I could have you follow follow me around and introduce me everywhere I yes. go because it's always the best. Um, but yeah, and also for everyone listening, there was an emphasis on that eight years because I have apparently lost track of how long it has been. Um, but in so many ways, it feels like yesterday and we yes. have stayed connected and it's been fun and I'm wearing Razorback gear today, Woo! which wasn't planned. Um, no. Totally random, just what I pulled out. I love it. I was at the Elite Eight on Monday, and it was so fascinating to me because I've been at the U of A for 30 years, and I ran into three students from every decade that I've taught. Going back to 1991, somebody came up to me in a bar and said, I think you were my teacher my <laughs> senior year. It was I love amazing that. so well i can win on one thing 91 was the year i was born oh thank you you're, you're <laughs> killing me killing me um and of course i love that you are our um, student commencement speaker the most entertaining student commencement speech of all time so you um you're just one of my favorites hunter as you know so i've had the pleasure of imposing on you across many cities rogers chicago mm -hmm. new york and seen you in a lot of different um, jobs and opportunities. And what I love is that every one of them is something that's self-taught, that you are really, you have a great enthusiasm for learning and you have made such a name for yourself in these domains that you work in. So I'd love if you could share where you are now and what that role looks like. Yeah, so um, thank you for that. Definitely have, um jumped around and kind of put a lot of different hats on, but I am currently living in New York City, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, um, but I am working for ACORN, which is actually headquartered in Northwest Arkansas. So I often, when I'm talking to clients, I tell them I've gone back to my roots, um, mm -hmm. a little uh, reference there. But um, yeah, so working at ACORN, I'm the only employee in um, New York City. so. That's been interesting mm -hmm. in a pandemic to start a new job and not meet people face to face. But um, Acorn obviously is in the influencer space, um, which is another, you know, I say back to my roots, but also because that's where my career started mm -hmm. at Collective Bias. So um, doing a lot with um, custom influencer content, activations that are specific to retailer um, and mostly Walmart. Um, I don't know what all else you want me to say, but what has been fascinating, something that um, has really been cool to see is the evolution of influencer marketing um, since I started eight years ago at Collective Bias when um, it was kind of the wild west. Like we mm -hmm. were one of the first uh, influencer and like mommy blogs weren't brand new by any means, but Collective Bias was really one of the first um, companies that turned it into a shopper marketing tool and was leveraging it with retailers. Um, so we were, we were figuring it all out. Um, there was, you know, we were building it as we went in a lot of cases. Um, and now to see the sophistication of influencer and they're really small businesses like they're not mm -hmm. mommy bloggers they're they're small business owners and and they're such an integral part of media plans um and and tools for for brands and retailers so it's it's been really cool to see that evolve 
So what do you think accounts for this continued growth that we're seeing in influencers? Because so many other things have caught our attention for a couple of years and then they fall by the wayside, but this one seems to stick and resonate with our consumers. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I kind of thought like, when does the, when does the bubble pop, right? Mm -hmm. Like, where does this go? But, um, you know, the reality is we as consumers spend most of our time right here. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing on that phone is consuming media on social platforms. Um, Facebook obviously was the first, um, depending on your core age demographic, yes. depends on whether or not how much time you're <laughs> spending there. Um, but you know, we're seeing it with, then Instagram comes, right? Facebook buys Instagram, still a huge platform where people just consume content. And it, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what, you know, whether it be, I'm catching up with you, Molly, I see what you're doing. I'm also following brands that I love, or I'm following influencers that I think are my friends that are not, or Real Housewives that I think are my friends. Mm -hmm. That's really the one. But then, you know, I don't think it's going anywhere because you look at what's happening on TikTok right now. Mm -hmm. TikTok is shaping our culture. It's not just a platform like Instagram started as like, oh, here's a place that you can upload your pictures and you can edit them and you can make it seem like you're a fancy photo editor, but really it's a filter, right? TikTok is kind of the same. Like it's, oh, here's a fun way to post dance or this or, or that. But like, if you look at, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but if you look at the like best new artist category, for the Grammys and like best record and like all of these Grammy nominations were songs that were made popular by TikTok and that took off because of TikTok. There was TikTok pasta. I don't know if you heard about that, mm -hmm. but like literally in Brooklyn, you couldn't buy the cheese. I, I didn't make it. Um, I'm, I'm a vegan, so I can't have cheese anymore, which is a sad life. Um, but um, <laughs> But like literally it was selling out in stores in Brooklyn because so many people were making it. So just when you think like, oh, Instagram is dying or, you know, Snapchat, no one's using that anymore. Like here comes TikTok, a whole new set of influencers, a whole new type of influencer and a whole new audience and, and really content medium for people to consume. And that's really what has kept it around for so long is the amount of time that we as shoppers are spending on those channels on that living on them you know I don't want to in a pandemic I mean my screen time was like I mean last March and April was terrifying um, <laughs> like literally like need to throw my phone out the window amount of time you know and especially like to go on that for a second sorry to cut your question off but what we saw any decline that might've been happening in influencer or content, when you take an entire country and you shut it down and you force people into their homes mm -hmm. for extended periods of time and restaurants are closed, schools are closed, daycares are closed, like where do you go to figure out, like people, my friend David had never boiled an egg. Like he literally was like, I don't, like I, like the restaurants are closed, I, I can't eat. <laughs> sandwich time all right well we need to have, fix that but like you know these these parents that are like entertaining their children or teaching them at school like they turn to the internet and to social media and influencers to figure out how to cook games to play with their kids activities sign like the whole thing so any decline that may have been happening is totally now irrelevant because so many people relied on um, you know, content creators to get through the last year. Absolutely. You know, this time last year, I was looking at my calendar and I was meeting with faculty to help them pivot to the technology that would be needed to, you know, basics like Zoom or, but also using our platforms here. And I had three meetings la this week, last year with faculty members who didn't own cell phones and didn't have internet in their homes. And when I look at what's happened in this year and how commonplace this is now, I can't even picture what last April was like. And yeah. I know that you're seeing that in your industry. Yeah, for sure. I mean, 
we, I was obviously working at Chicory at the time. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, I mean, on the, on March 13th, when cities shut down, mm -hmm. um, pretty much within, from March to April, I lost 50% of my book of business. Um, but that was due not as much to, I mean, it was a fear, right? Like right. we don't know what's going to happen, but also supply chain was completely bogged down, right? Like they couldn't, like when the world is shut down, you can't get product to stores. And then also the stores couldn't keep their shelves stocked. Like you don't need to advertise in a world where you can't keep product on your shelf. In fact, if you're advertising and they go to the shelf, that's a poor experience. Now we're on the flip side of that, where grocery and CPG had the best year of their lives. They'll know, I mean, they're never, it's, it's, it's an outlier, right? They're never going to repeat that, even though their retailers are holding them accountable to, to repeat to it, do that, especially on the, the e-commerce front. Um, but what happens, right? Like, you know, maybe you've bought Cottonelle for the last 15 years you no long, you went to the store or did your pickup and you couldn't get Cottonelle because it wasn't on the shelf. So you tried Charmin and now you're like, oh, I really like Charmin. I'm going to be a Charmin shopper now. Like that's what brands are battling is, mm -hmm. you know, did they lose core customers to competition because it was all that was available? Did they gain customers because they were all that was available? And how do they get their old customers back and keep the new ones that they have earned. It's an ex awfully exciting time to be you and navigating all of this. And I'll tell you, Hunter, I've been a fan of Acorn for a while, but, and I'm so impressed with my interactions I've had with them over the last six months and they're hiring a lot of my students. I'm so grateful. They really got my attention when they persuaded you to <laughs> join their ranks. And I mean, I. I'm just such a fan of the work that's done. I wonder if you could give an example of like a a day in the life. What I know it's weird because you're remoting from so far away, but what would a, a typical day look like for you? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I work, I didn't say this before, so I'm glad you brought this up. I work in sales, business development, whatever fancy way you want to call it. I'm the, I call it, I joke. I was in client services at Collective Bias. I was in strategy at Mashable. And then I went into sales. So I joke about it being the dark side. Um, but really, I think it's the best side. Um, so my day is, is really balanced between two things. So I have my, my active book of business mm -hmm. where I have contracts in-house. We have programs running. So I'm serving those clients. And then new book of business or prospecting. So the day kind of varies, but I'll give you a little glimpse inside of like what each is like. So on the prospecting side and the new business side, that's really a ton of outreach, um, leveraging, you know, contacts in the industry. Hey, do you know this person? Could you get me connected? Um, that's the best case scenario is, hey, I know that you know this person. I'd like to chat with them. That's like A plus winner. Um, a lot of times it's like, you don't, you don't know the person, you have no idea, like they don't know you, especially if you're reaching out to agency partners or like shopper marketing managers who probably have, there's like hundreds of mm -hmm. sales people just like me that want their attention. So it's really like getting creative with how you reach out to them. And I mean, the biggest part, right, is that you're providing value in mm -hmm. what you send. I'm often on the receiving end of sales outreach, but more for like, here's a business tool that you could use to grow your book of business. And like, it's not personal. It's not, it's like, I can tell that I am one out of a thousand people on a mail merge that is set to send out on this day and this time. And if I don't respond, I'll get a templated email. So it's really about how can you form a relationship with someone via email and present them with enough quality and data that makes them want to respond and say, yes, I'll take the meeting. Because on the new business side, it's all about like, get the meeting. Because I feel confident, like if I can get someone on Zoom or in person, like I can get at least like an RFP or, or something will come of that. 
Um, but that struggle is real. Like, honestly, I, there will be weeks when I'll send a hundred emails to people and maybe get like two responses. Oh gosh. So that side is a grind, but eventually, I mean, it works, something clicks, right? Or you, you get through, um, or you get creative enough that they will say like, I'm sorry, I just wanted to respond because I usually start like putting Beyonce in the subject line or <laughs> talking about like talking about random shit that has nothing to do with business. I'm like, let me just get your attention. And yeah. then they'll be like, this was a creative email, but I'm not interested. And I'm like, you know what? I'll take that as a half win because <laughs> you didn't just ignore me forever. Um, so, but, so that's on the new business side. It's a, it's a grind. And, and I think that's where, honestly, the U of A has been revolutionary in my sales career because I am, my friends are shopper marketing managers. My friends are sales analysts. My friends are working in this community. And that, I mean, part of it is relationships and just like the network that, has been created here um really I, I who depending on who hears this interview or whatever we want to call it like really college is networking like mm -hmm. that like they there's they joke about harvard business school like you don't really go for the education you go for your section and who you're going to meet so there is a lot of that that's helpful so i'm really talking a lot about something that could have been very simple on the new on the active business side so a lot of times I'm, you know, I get the meeting, I pitch, we start to build proposals, we start to build recommendations. I'm really working closely with strategy. So we have strategists on our team who kind of are the, the sauce of everything. Like they're the ones that are pulling all of the levers to make sure everything is gonna come out nicely on the media plan. Um, you close it, you sell it in. And then really at that point, I'm handing it over to an execution team, but my job is to, to make sure that, you know, there's line of sight into what's coming next. You know, what, what are the, you know, where, where can we build this? Um, where do we go from here, right? Are you happy? Is the, are the teams happy? That's a lot of like, okay, the pressure's off. I sold the deal, but now let's make sure that everyone um, is, is pleased. But um, to summarize that, a day in the life is me, talking incessantly at computer <laughs> screens and on a lot of channels, um, whether it's email or Slack or phone calls, just slinging media, slinging influencers. All the time. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm gonna argue with one sentence that you said in that. Going okay. back several minutes, you said, there are thousands of people like me. And <laughs> I would argue, Hunter, there is no one like you. So yeah. you just have to, Get that Beyonce subject line and get them. Right. Sometimes it is more, I, I say this a lot, like, I mean, I'm very lucky that I'm working at a place like Acorn that has mm -hmm. such quality products and such, like it's, I, I don't have to sell something and worry about whether or not the client will be happy, mm -hmm. um, which is not the case with a lot of salespeople, you have, you know, it's more of a grind because you also are doubting the product, but a lot of it, I, I say is like, honestly, just charisma. And like, if you're, if you're in sales and you're one of a hundred people and 90 out of those hundred have a product that could get the client to the end goal, then like, mm -hmm. how easy do you make it for them? How nice are you? do they, are you pleasant? <laughs> like, do they want to talk to you? Cause like in some cases I'm talking to clients weekly, right? It's like, mm -hmm. sometimes that's the battle because these clients are so busy and they have so much on their plate. You don't want to be another thing to bog that down. Right. And they have to trust in you the same way that you're trusting in the rest of the acorn team. Exactly. Exactly. Which is huge for me, especially at this state in my career mm -hmm. when I do make a jump from, you know, I was very successful at Chicory and had great clients. And so to make a jump to a place like Acorn, right, there's a level of trust that comes with, you right. know, um, me as a, as a brand in the industry. Um, 
that that you know again is is equal parts I'm happy about that, right? And I feel very proud of that and thankful that I have that, but it's also a little terrifying when I know that people are like, okay, well, we'll, we'll give you this test because we trust you. And I'm like, Ugh, Ugh. I wish it was for something other than that, uh, but no, it's, it's good. Well, if you ever need an advocate to tell them why they should trust you. Yeah, I'm gonna just have I'm you email person. everyone for me. and then I'll do it. <laughs> Well, Hunter, thank you so much for taking time today. And I hope that our next visit is in person, whether that's New yeah. York or if we get you down here in Northwest Arkansas. I, I am hopeful that in a vaccinated world, I will be down to meet my team that I work yes. with all the time. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Well, I'll be pestering you then as well, just to add on to my long list of times I've imposed. But thank you, Hunter, for joining us today and sharing with my students a little more about ACORN. Yeah, of course.